All right, howdy folks. I'm gonna be doing some closure live coding. I figured I would record this. I uh, actually went to a meetup last night and did basically the same thing, but I wanted to record it for people who weren't there or who might be interested, so here we go. I uh, wanted to give, especially Ruby folks, a chance to see what it's like to program in Clojure and what some of the key differences are. So we had this meetup last night that um, it's the Triangle Ruby, Ruby Brigade in North Carolina, and I was I was kind of the Clojure representative there and did some live coding in Clojure. The, uh, application that I'm going to be building is going to connect to the GitHub API to calculate the top 10 contributors to any given GitHub repository. So that's what we're going to do. And along the way, we're going to use REPL-driven development, and we'll get a chance to see kind of what it's like to program in Clojure. So, <clears throat> so here we go. Um, I've got the uh, API documentation here for GitHub. Um, first thing I'm going to do when I create a Clojure uh, application is I'm going to use Liningen to create a new Clojure application. And Liningen is a build tool and project manager for Clojure apps. And line is the command line, uh, you know, program name for that. So I'm going to say line new and I'll call this CLJ GitHub API. And this is a lot like Rails new. It's going to just generate a project for us. So if I CD into that directory, that's the files and directories that it created for us. Uh, those are all just kind of stubbed out files that you can put stuff into. I'm going to be spending most of my time in this. This is the only file under the source directory. Um, so most of our time is going to be spent there, but I'm also going to start in this project.clj file because that's the project definition. So to dive in a little bit, I'm actually going to use SpaceMax. I'm using SpaceMax here not just because I use it every day and I, I think it's a good editor, um, but specifically for Clojure it's really nice. It turns out that the majority of Clojure developers, according to surveys, use Emacs for their development. Emacs or some variety of Emacs like SpaceMax. SpaceMax is kind of a distribution of Emacs. And one of the reasons that I think SpaceMax is a really good way to get started, if you're curious about doing that, get started in Clojure development, is that space FED to open up my dot file if I look at my dot file, this is just, just the configuration for SpaceMax. And really all you have to do um, to get a really good set of tools installed in SpaceMax for Clojure use is add Clojure to the configuration layers. And that's going to use a lot of different Emacs packages that a lot of professional Clojure developers use. And it's going to package them all up together and give you some nice, accessible mnemonic key bindings to access all that functionality. So I think it's a pretty good way to get started. Just add one line to your uh, stock SpaceMax configuration there, and you're good to go. Um, but let's get started here. So I'm going to go to Code Scratch CLJ and then open up my project file. Liningen, as I said, is the tool that I'm using. This is a Liningen project file. And this just has some information about the project, uh, probably pretty familiar stuff, maybe different syntax than you're used to, but um, you know, so it's pretty familiar type of information here. Um, the one thing that I'll use a little bit here is dependencies. And this is the list of dependencies that this project has. This is a lot like your gem file in Rubyland. Um, this is a list of sort of third party jars, which are kind of the closure version of gems. Um, that this project depends on. So right now the only thing we depend on is the latest stable version of Clojure 1.8.0. Um, so there's that. Now I'm going to jack in, so comma for Clojure specific functionality, S for REPL, and I for CIDR jack in. And that's going to start me a, a Clojure REPL that is going to be integrated with my editor, and this is thanks to an Emacs package called CIDR. So uh, that's going to start a REPL for me. In, in some ways, it's really no different than starting a REPL on the command line, if you just say line REPL. Um, but let me show you what that looks like. Switch to my REPL buffer here. And this is kind of some, some help information that I'm actually not going to care about right now. But uh, this is just basic closure REPL stuff. Again, you can do this on a command line. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, but as we'll see in a minute, I'm going to actually use some of the, the integration between 
uh, Clojure REPL and Emacs to do my development. So, um, and that, that's kind of called REPL driven devel development. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Let me switch over to my um, source file. And <clears throat> this is my this is my source. This is just the template from Leiningen's new uh, command. The first line just says um, I have a namespace here. The namespace is called CLJ GitHub API dot core. Um, basically, in Clojure, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between files and namespaces. Um, there doesn't have to be, but if you violate that, you're going to confuse people. So don't do that. <laughs> um, and other than that, I just have this basically useless function definition here. Um, but to show a little bit of integration here, if I, let's see, I think it's comma space B, comma space capital N, and I've just evaluated everything in that file and also switched to that namespace. So now I can actually call the foo function and um, pretty useless function, but it does demonstrate that I have access to that code in the REPL, which is kind of useful. Still only kind of scratching the surface of what we can do with the REPL. Um, but let me show you something else. So I'm gonna get rid of this foo function because I really don't need it. Um, and inside a comment form, which means uh, ignore everything in here whenever you're evaluating this namespace, I'm gonna, well, let's just do the same thing. Um, I'm going to have a closure form there, and I'm going to send this, this form over to the REPL in the background. The REPL is going to evaluate it for us and give us the result back, and then we'll, we will display that result right there in our editor window. So if I say comma E for evaluate and E for CIDR eval last S expression, then as you can see, it gives me the evaluation of that expression right there in my editor window. So pretty useful feature and this is this is more like it this is what i'm going to use to do my ripple driven development now i've been talking about this thing REPL driven development for a little bit here let me explain a little bit more about what i mean by that you're probably familiar especially as a rubyist um, at doing test driven development tdd and uh, i i know there's kind of some different camps in tdd and and i'm i'm kind of I, I know TDD fairly well. I'm not like an expert at it, um, but from what I understand, one of the primary benefits of doing TDD is that you're getting really fast feedback on a really small incremental change. And so you can have high confidence that as you test this small thing that you added and you have a fast feedback loop going on, you're confident that that piece is correct. And then you can kind of, once, it's, once you're confident in that and you have it added, then you take the next incremental change and you build up from there and take these small little changes and, and you're, you're confident as you build this thing that it's right. So it's a good sense of like this, this traction that you feel uh, as you're developing. So I like that a lot. And I think when you do TDD well, you can, you can really experience that. And it's a good feeling. You feel like you're really um, writing some good software and you're confident that it works. That's exactly what I'm gonna, gonna do with REPL driven development um, is the same thing. I want fast feedback on the code that I'm writing and I'm gonna write just a small piece at a time, get some feedback on that and make sure that it's right. So same kind of um, value proposition there. I, of course, the downside of, of REPL driven development is that uh, I'm not gonna have a test suite at the end unless I specifically try to do that, which I, I can do, I'm not going to here, but um, so for, especially for longer lived programs than, than what I'm doing here, which is kind of a throwaway program, um, I do like test suites, and, and in fact, you can totally do test-driven development in Clojure. Um, I've done that; it, it, it works fine. Um, but, and just to say, there there are fat ways to do fast feedback loops in Clojure TDD as well, um, even though the JVM does take a little bit of time to start up. So, so you can totally do that. I'm not going to do that here because I thought REPL-driven development might be a little bit more interesting to show to Rubyists. So, that's what I'll do. Um, so back to the problem at hand. Um, I'm trying to fetch some information from a GitHub API. Now, to do that, the API is all in HTTP, so I'm gonna use an HTTP library to actually fetch that because I'm not a barbarian. <laughs> I'm not gonna write that myself. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna use a third-party library and a, a jar, again, like a Ruby gem. And I can actually hot load that into my project, comma, R for refactor, A for add, P for project dependency. 
and it'll actually search Clojars for seal for, for whatever you type in here. I'm going to get CLJ HTTP at the latest version, which looks like it was just released today. That's interesting. Um, and it's going to hot load that into my REPL process along with all of its dependencies. And so I can see in my REPL, it's telling me, hey, I, I, I loaded this stuff. By the way, it also added a dependency to my project. So it's kind of useful. And now that I've added that to my project, I can require it in this namespace. Um, so I'm going to do that here. Require the CLJ HTTP dot client namespace from that library. And I'm going to alias it as HTTP. Now, why is this two separate steps? Why do I need to require this? Well, if you're familiar with Rails, Rails is going to do a lot of these kind of requires for you automatically, implicitly, behind the scenes. And the, the, you can certainly make the argument that that's convenient and you, you spare yourself having to write all these different requires. And I, I can see that. I mean, that's useful not to have to go through the tedium of that. But I actually kind of prefer Clojure's way of doing this. Um, and the reason why is that if I'm on a Rails project that I didn't write, sometimes even if I did write it, sometimes it's using things and I'm going, where is this thing? What, what is this thing that it's using? What is this method that it's using? What is this object? Where is this coming from? What does it mean? And it's not easy to know where it comes from. A lot of times I have to do a project search to figure out where some, some object or class or method comes from. And even then, sometimes if it's a third party gem, it's not going to find it. So um, I don't like that. I like having an explicit require. You actually have to do this in Clojure. If you're going to use anything in a namespace, you have to require it. And so you know where something's coming from. You can tell just by the namespace declaration at the top. So I kind of prefer that way. It's just a matter of taste, but that is a difference between Clojure and maybe not Ruby so much as Rails, but there you go. So now I can actually use this namespace and the functions therein. And I can say HTTP namespace get function, and I'm going to give this a URL. Uh, what is the URL? Well, let's define a URL. So I will wrap this, space kw to wrap that in parens, insert let URL be something. And this is a let block. This is extremely common idiom in Clojure and really any Lisp code. Um, all this is doing is it's giving you some names. It's defining some, some bindings between names and values so that you can use those names in the body of the let, which is everything, everything after that close bracket there. So what is the URL? It's going to be https uh, api.github.com. This is where I copy that string, paste it in. I'm going to change a uh, couple of placeholder values here, and let's say Rails Rails. <clears throat> as the repo that I'm going to fetch. So I would evaluate this as it is, but this is actually one of the weaker points of um, the Emacs integration here. If I do this as it is, this is like two and a half megabytes of HTTP response, a lot of JSON in there, and it actually bogs down my editor a fair bit. So um, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to make you wait on it. Uh, but what I will do is let's look to see just what we get back. Okay, it's a closure.lang.persistent hash map. Now, this is just the, the standard built-in closure hash map. There, there's a few different types of maps in closure, but they all work the same way, uh, at least in terms of their interface. And it's just standard map. I mean, you look up values at a key, you, you can add things to the map, you can delete things from the map, different things like that. So standard hash map concept there. Um, but this actually represents something that I think is important to mention because it's not it's not obvious, but it actually runs pretty deep to the philosophy of closure. And the thing is that in closure, you're not dealing with objects as much. You're not dealing with objects and methods and all of those familiar object-oriented paradigm um, concepts. You're dealing with data structures and functions. And usually those functions are pure, which means they have no side effects. It's a very different way of thinking, but when you're doing closure, this is actually something that you'll find throughout the entire community, um, both in the core closure stuff by you know the closure team, the core team, but also in all the third party libraries, all the applications that use closure, it's not it's not 100%, you'll find some exceptions, but in general, it's very common that when you're doing closure programming, you spend as much time as you can 
dealing with standard core closure data structures and standard core closure functions. And the reason for that is that um, really it's kind of a joy to be programming those things. They, they just work, they're extremely well designed. The data structures are, are super solid, they're, they're immutable, which is really interesting. I'm not really gonna get into that. Um, but they're also performant, they're not slow. Uh, like you might expect, uh, given the interface of an immutable data structure. So, um, so it's just really nice to use those things. And what's going to happen is that most of the libraries that you use in Clojure, they're going to give you a Clojure data structure for their results as soon as they can. And you're basically going to hold on to that data structure and maybe do some you know, transformations of it as long as you can. And then at the last minute, maybe you'll pass that off to some some side effecting operation, maybe printing things to the screen or something like that, but, or maybe, here's a, here's a quick example. To do uh, HTML layout and, and markup in Clojure, you treat HTML as a Clojure data structure, and then at the last minute, you actually transform that into the HTML markup itself. So that's a good example. Um, but this is pretty common, and this is exactly what we see here. CLJ HTTP is giving us a, an HTTP response, but it's not giving us a response object that has its own methods, its own ways of doing things. It's giving us the data structure. And so I don't have to know anything about any response object. I don't have to look up any API documentation. I already know how, you know, what functions I can use on a map because that's basic closure knowledge. So um, I actually like that a lot. So for example, I can look at the keys of this map and I see there's a set of keys that you probably would expect more or less for a, um, a response object including things like body, uh, length, status, uh, headers. Those are all pretty important pieces of data about a response. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is that these things are prefixed by a colon. And coming from Ruby, that's actually a pretty similar construct to what you would expect in Ruby, which is a symbol, except in Clojure, it's called a keyword. So, but, but more or less the same concept. One key difference is, uh, no pun intended, is that uh, in a keyword in Clojure, these things actually implement the function interface, IFN. And what that means is that they can be invoked as a function. And if you do that, what that means is that you're looking up, in, in whatever hash map that you give it, you're looking up the value at that key. So it's kind of looking itself up in the map, if you will. So headers, for example, if I pass, if I, if I call headers as a function here, I'll see the list of headers for that um, response. And that's a little bit more than I can easily show here. So why don't I inspect that? Comment D for debug, V for slider, inspect. And uh, this is my list of headers. So common stuff if you're used to HTTP. The things I'm going to point out are there's a content type, application JSON. So we'll need to parse the body of this if we're going to get any useful data out of it. And the other thing I'll mention just for fun is that I'm under a rate limit. I'm not actually authenticating to the GitHub API, so I only, only have 60 requests per hour, but it's not a problem. Um, I, I can pretty easily authenticate. I've actually done that, but it's not super interesting, so I figured I wouldn't show it here. Just a, I don't know, five lines of code and, and we're done on that, but I'm not going to show that here. So again, I get a JSON object here, and so I'd expect this to be a string. And it is, it's a JSON string. Um, how big is it? So 2.4 million characters. It's you know pretty decent sized. Um, let's see here. How do I parse this? Well, I'm gonna use a third party library for this because again, I'm not a barbarian. <laughs> not gonna try to write that by hand. I think I'd lose all of you and myself because that's not super interesting. Um, so I'm gonna do this. I'm going to require that, but I actually need to add the project dependency, CLJ JSON. There are other options for um, uh, JSON parsing and closure, but CLJ JSON is a common one and it, it works fine, so we'll do that. JSON parse string. Um, again, I'm not going to run this as it is because it's going to bog down my editor if I do, so let's just see what we get back. Okay, closure.lang.persistent vector. This is Clojure's built-in array type. It's a little bit fancier than an array in terms of its implementation, but the interface is really just one of an array. So um, looks like we're getting a basically JSON array of contributors back. 
So remembering kind of what API endpoint we're hitting. This is a contributor's endpoint. So let's look and see what one of these things looks like. This is not going to bog down my editor. So, um, oops, you know what? I should have uh, comma dv to inspect that last thing I got back. And it's got it's a map, so that's good to see um, as you know key value store. It has total. This is the total number of commits for this contributor. So that's we will use that information. I remember we're getting the top 10 contributors for a given repo, so we'll need to make use of that information. Um, the other thing that we'll use is who is this person, this contributor, and that's in the author key. And it looks like this is a nested map inside of that. So let's look what's in there. And the thing we're going to use is this login. Um, that's the GitHub username. I'm not going to pronounce that because I might get it wrong and it, I might be swearing in some language and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so uh, no offense to that user. <laughs> I just don't know. Um, but let's get that information out of the hash map. So to do that, um, let's actually clean this up a little bit. It's starting to get a little bit tedious. This is a pretty deeply nested bunch of parens. So instead of continuing to wrap this thing, let's, uh, let's kind of clean it up a little bit. So Let's call this piece here the response, and we'll add that to our list of let bindings. And um, let's actually call this whole thing the contrib. So this is just the first contributor. We'll call it contrib. So we'll just, again, make a name for that thing. And inside our contrib, remember this is a map. So I'm going to get total out of that. And that should be, yeah, 46. So this is the number of commits. So that's good. Um, let's get in. So this is a nested lookup. I think the Ruby method, method for that is dig, but I'm not actually sure about that. Uh, author login is where we want it to go. So this is my sequence of keys that I'm looking up inside this data structure. Actually comment that out just because. Okay, good. So I'm not going to say that, but um, that's correct. Okay. Uh, great. So now we have two different pieces of information. Let's combine those things into a single data structure. Good choice for this. It's kind of a self-descriptive data structure would be a hash map. And we'll call the first thing number of commits. And we'll call the second thing username. By the way, this um, stuff that I'm doing with... Um, slurping these forms into the current thing, stuff like that. That's all in space max with space K for Lisp. And then I'm doing things like S for slurp and my font is big enough that you can't see all of it, but um, pretty useful set of, this is called structural editing, sometimes called pair edit. Um, but it's, if you understand it, it's actually pretty, pretty speedy. So let's see what that evaluates to. Good, okay, num commits 46, username that guy. Um, so that's what we want. Uh, I think I think we can name this. I think we can define this. This looks like a pretty good piece of functionality here. So let's name it um, make contrib. Probably not the best name, but it'll do for now. It takes contrib as an argument and just returns that. Now evaluate the function definition to be sure that our REPL knows about that function. And it should be able to evaluate that, get the same result, and I can. So that's great. Let me just mention here, this is REPL-driven development, right? I'm getting very fast feedback on very small changes, and so I'm confident that as I'm building this thing, it works. Okay, so that's that's looking good, but this is only the information for the first contributor. What we really want to do is um, make this the maybe all of the contributors. So let's say this. Contribs is all of them instead of just getting the first one. And instead of uh, calling make contrib once, I'm actually going to call it for each of the contributors in this contribs array. And let's see how that looks. Okay, inspect that. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Num commits 46, and it goes down from there. Different usernames. Okay, that looks cool. Um, Great, so I think the next thing I'll do, um, the this looks like it's sorted by num commits already, but I don't trust it. The API documentation actually doesn't, doesn't guarantee that it is. 
So I'm going to manually sort it. That's actually not hard to do. I'm going to be using the thread last macro, um, which is basically taking this thing as the value and inserting it here into this last slot of that S expression, and then taking the result of that and threading it into the last slot of the next one, um, and so on. So the next one's going to be sort by, same as you would see in Ruby. And just like in Ruby, you give it a function to sort this thing by. And remember that in Clojure, um, keywords are invocable, so I can just say num commits, and that counts as a function. So that looks good. Um, let's just make sure that we get what we expect here. And that looks pretty good. Okay. Um, let's reverse. We really only want the top contributors, so we want to sort descending have the top people up top. And uh, we also only want the top 10 contributors, so we'll go ahead and take 10 here. Let's see what we get. Okay, great. Starting with DHH and Tender Love. Great. Top contributors to Rails. Okay, that looks pretty good. I think we're ready to name this thing. Um, let's call it Git Contribs. Defin get contribs, no arguments at the moment. Right now, Rails repo is hard coded there. We'll change that in just a minute, but let's be sure that we're getting what we want. And perfect, looks great. Okay, so let's take out that hard coding. Let's, let's call this function with the repo. And I'm going to use Clojure's built-in core function format, which is basically sprintf, if you're familiar with that. So slap a percent %s in there and add the repo, and that's going to get inserted into that string. Make sure the REPL knows about my new function definition, and then call it. OK, that's looking great. OK. So right now we have this as a data structure. It's time to finally get out of the core standard libs of Clojure and print this thing to the user. So to do that, I'm going to use a closure function that's it's not part of the core namespace, but it is part of the closure, closure distribution. And it's in the closure pprint namespace. And I'm going to refer the function directly out of that namespace. Uh, the function is print table. So print table that. Let's see what it does. OK, it doesn't return anything because printing functions don't return anything. But if I go to my REPL process, um, it actually printed that information. So that's a nice, pretty printed form of my data here. So that's that looks good. Um, I think I kind of like username coming first before num commits. So let's do that. I'm going to clear that out so that uh, next thing we print will be better. Let's reverse the order of those two key value pairs, update the function definition, do that, and now, great, now username comes first. Looks great, okay. Clear that. Uh, I, I kind of want the rank to come in as maybe the first column. I think that would be a nice touch. Um, so let's do that as well. Uh, I think instead of map, I'm going to say map indexed, if I can type it. And I don't remember what the definition of that is exactly, so I'm going to look at the doc string for that. Returns a lazy sequence consisting of the result of applying f to 0 and the first item of collection. So the index is first and then the item. All right, so now make contrib is actually going to get a different argument here. Um, index contrib. And I'm doing destructuring here because I'm getting a, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure that's right. I think, I think maybe we don't need that, but we'll find out. It'll blow up on us if we don't. So rank is going to be the increment of index, in other words, 1 plus index. Let's update that function definition and that one, and let's see what we get. Huh. Oh, you know what? We didn't, uh, we're putting the rank beforehand. I actually haven't rehearsed this part. So we're getting the index from uh, before we do the reverse. So let's undo those changes. 
Um, and let's map indexed add rank. Add rank is going to be index and item, which item is a contrib hash. So I'm going to return the association to the contrib hash of rank to be the increment of index. And oops. And let's see if that works. Wrong number of args passed to make contrib. Did I not undo quite far enough? Make contrib. Uh, now I lost my error message. Da, 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 da. I think uh, make contrib. Oh, you know what? I didn't evaluate that new definition once I undid my changes. Okay, awesome. That looks great. Now the rank is at the end. Um, I'll live with that for now. I, I could change that, but um, I would redo the whole map. Uh, well, what the heck? I'll go ahead and do it. All right. So apply hash map to be, let me think about this. Um, eh, I don't know. Okay, let's do it this way. Destructuring username num commits. And now I'm going to say rank is ink of index. Username is username. Num commits is num commits. And now rank should come first. And it does. Okay, great. Kind of a longhand way of doing it, but that's all right. Good enough for now. Okay, last thing is let's um, make this accessible from the command line. The way to do that is there's a closure function, um, or it's, it's a convention. I'm actually not sure. It might be a line again convention, but the main function in a namespace is named dash main. And this main function, I don't even need to say defin for it because I can just use a higher order f function called compose. It's going to compose two functions together. And that's exactly what I want. So if I change this to dash main rails rails, um, just to prove it to you, whoops. Um, there we go. Printed things out correctly. So now I just need to tell line again what the main f uh, namespace in my project is. So that's that. I need to actually save this file, which I haven't done yet. And uh, now if I go to the command line, I'm already in my right directory here, so I'll just say line run rails rails. And that should work. Gotta wait just a second for things to spin up and works great. I can also do closure closure, different repo there. And the top contributor to closure closure is empty. Um, th this is something weird that happens. I haven't actually taken the time to understand what happens, but some responses from the, H from the API are weird in some way that breaks. I don't quite understand what's going on, but I just re-ran it and it works. Obviously, if this were anything more than a throwaway app, I would want to diagnose that, that issue. But it looks like top contributor to Clojure is Rich Hickey, which is not surprising because he's the designer of the language. So uh, that's all I got for you. Just to emphasize a little bit here, the REPL-driven development aspect of this, I, I, I thought was really nice. I, I like that style of development. Um, if, if this were a longer-lived project, I would probably add tests at this point and think about what some good tests would be. Um, kind of test last development, maybe, uh, TLD. But um, yeah, that's about all I got for you. Thanks for your time and attention, and um, maybe we'll have, uh, have some content like this in the future. If you actually like this, let me know. Um, this is the first time I've done this, so I'd be interested to hear if uh, anything I can improve on, or, or even if you just liked it. I think it'd be, um, it would help me know whether this is worth doing in the future. So um, cool, that's all I got. Thanks a lot.